9.30 on a Thursday night, and you are tuned in to Beltway Radio and Beyond, which can mean one and only thing. This is Chip Chat. Welcome to Chip Chat, everybody. I'm Chip. Tez is on assignment tonight. So joining us is Stacy. Hi, Stacy. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, we were off for a few weeks for Thanksgiving, which resulted in much turkey and once again proving Alton Brown wrong. Uh, so I'm proud of that. How was your Thanksgiving? Did you succeed in proving Alton Brown wrong? Um, I We went to a restaurant. It was fantastic. Oh, I'm sure that was great, too. Uh, okay. Uh, also, there was an awards show, which we are going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, let's see. Trump is a dictator in waiting. That that was cool to find out this week. There's a lot of quiet part out loud uh, in the news this week. The situation in Israel and Gaza is deteriorating. So, unfortunately, we do have to talk about that. And, um, yeah, Tez is in here, but his people were spying on us all this time. Did you know that, Brian? And um, which, which, which two? What? He has a lot of boxes to check. Uh, the Cubans in this case. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I heard about the the some drones came over uh, the castle at, Ra- at Ravens Park today. So, oh, yeah, OK, so well, that might be on. happening, too. OK, well, we'll have to get to that. Let's see uh, what else is going on. There is curling news, which is why it's really good that Stacey's here. Uh, I don't know. What's the news in the curling world, Stacey? Oh, remember all the drama of last year? We're going to do a one year update as to Pretty where cool. at least local curling is now. It just got swept under the rug. Pretty much. There you go. That was bad. Uh, Okay, let's see what else. Oh, there's crazy news about dumb Kevin. And normally when we have news about dumb Kevin, it's just about how he's dumb. But not this week. Oh, no. Stay tuned if you don't already know. It's going to be wild. That's the words, right? It's going to be wild. That's what you say right before an interaction. Uh, also, we have a guest this week. We have a a, a brilliant guest. Uh, she's an author and and writer and uh, I don't know what to call it, but like collector of anthologies. That's that's the word maybe or like a compiler. We can ask her. We'll ask her. What's the actual title for people who do this? But anyway, so uh, Nora Shalloway Carpenter is going to be here and uh, we're going to talk to her about her books, all kinds. of. It's going to be. It's, it's a packed show. There's just so much to talk about. I didn't even know because I didn't write it, but, um, you know, we'll see. Brian, did you have a good uh, break? Yeah, it's been, it was, it's busy as well as fun. So festive. Yeah. Okay, good. We're going to ask you stuff later. You won some awards. Yeah, a lot of hardware. <laughs> yeah. Brian's got a lot more awards. Whoever owns this network really likes that guy. So <laughs> it's good. Good to know. All right, Stacey, do you remember how to do the word thing? Yes. Okay. So uh, do you have a word? Yes. Okay. Well, let's see if it works. Uh, So anyway, everybody get ready. Sit back, grab some. Latkes. It's bagel time. You're listening to the best show, the only show, Chip Chat on Beltway Radio and beyond. Sweeps. Chip with me tonight is Stacy. Say hi to Stacy. Hello. Uh, so thank you for uh, mentioning latkes. It is Hanukkah after all. Happy Hanukkah to, to everybody. Happy Hanukkah to you. Thank you. We we lit our first set of candles tonight, and uh, we'll continue doing so for the next eight days until the uh, what the Goyim call menorah, but is actually called a Hanukkah. Uh, gets so hot that it melts everything around it. So, you know, 
The fire gets increasingly large. Uh, as some people know, Hanukkah took place, the, the, the holiday that it, the event that it commemorates took place in Israel, uh, which is what we're, we're going to have to talk about next. So we've Before been we do, like, quick, qu quick question, um, yeah. as a chef and someone who probably enjoys latkes, uh, sour cream or applesauce. So this recently the Goyim have found out that this is a long standing debate. Uh, neither is bad. They're both good. I I, I like everything. It, I'm not going to say no. That That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Traditionally, in my family, what have we had? is more applesauce than sour cream. But but access to both, good. It's all good. <laughs> the only problem you really get into is not so much a latke debate as it is a blintz's debate. And it, if people put fruit in the blintzes that that's not correct it, it shouldn't be that it should be cheese blintzes with various fruit compote on the side so you can you know get a cheese blintz and you know cut a little piece of it and scoop a little bit of blueberries on it perfect that that's the way to do it if you got blueberry blintzes you got to put sour cream on it you're kind of going the wrong direction i'm glad that's, we were able to settle this yeah yeah uh but no er everything is good we uh we went to the store today. We got uh some potatoes and and some onions. We're gonna make some latkes uh during the week. If you want to know, you want the, you know the the yellow or the golds, uh potatoes things that that make good strings when you grate them. It's nice. You don't want the the mealy, uh sort of russet types that are good for mashing. That's not good for for latkes. And and the really important trick is to soak the starch out of them. So you, you grate it and soak them in the water and get the starch out and squeeze them, squeeze the potatoes to get that starch out so that when you mix up your, your, your latkes and they hit the pan, they start to, to brown off nicely. And you don't got to deal with all that, that ooey gooey starch. That's no good. Not in this application and save it for later. Of course, potato starch. You want that. You need it at Passover. Okay. Anyway, back to Israel. So, um, there's a terrible war going on. And one of the ways that we on this show are trying to deal with this is to only revisit this periodically because it could take up the entire show and it could be like our only focus. And for people like me and the way that, that I've got family involved in the conflict and all of this, I really got to like limit my consumption of the news about this in pretty profound ways. It's so funny. yeah, it's probably smart. Uh, thanks to my therapist uh, for helping me sort all that out. If you don't have a therapist, go get one. Uh, yes. People have therapists for their dogs. You are more important than a dog. Sorry. Yes, you are. That's also, my, that's all humans. <laughs> yes. If you have a car, you have a mechanic. Right. So if you have a brain, you ought to have a therapist. 100 percent agree. Love it. how that works. Mine happens to be a Spartan, but she's good otherwise. So anyway, you anyway. would you would so have a therapist that actually is a Spartan. <laughs> I, don't yeah, know so I make a point Sorry, to back to very serious subjects. Extra Michigan gear every time I, I'm on my video chat with her just to kind of rub it in. But all right. So. Several weeks ago, kind of at the beginning of this conflict, when we first decided we were willing to talk about it, it wasn't exactly the beginning. It was, it was a, I guess it was two weeks in. Is that, is that about right, Brian? Something like that. Yeah, it was kind of, yeah, it was the early part. Yeah. yeah we, we, so we decided we had to, we had to mention it. I said something on the air that, you know, at the time might've been our favorite Thing to engage in on this show rampant speculation uh it wasn't it wasn't it was true it was true so uh brian you have you have the clip all right go ahead and roll the tape somewhere in the middle of all of this chaos hamas got their hands on some fucking paragliders and bulldozers and shit how they got them don't know this whole idea that iran is the smoking gun doesn't seem to be any direct evidence of it and I mean, people would lean to that, obviously, but it, there's probably, 
But we don't know. We don't know. And there's no need to spec. Like, they got There's no need to speculate yeah. about it. They had paragliders, and they had bulldozers, and they busted through the fence or jumped over the fence, and they got into some of these uh, kibbutzim and settlements that are near Gaza and attacked uh, Israel. They killed over a thousand people. The death toll still being still, yeah, still going. still going up. They occupied towns. They fought house to house. They carried Kidnapped. they carried off hostages back to Gaza. They they attacked Israel in the most brutal, uh, horrific, savage way you could imagine. I'm not going to go into what they did yeah. because it is too painful to, to consider. But if you can think of an awful atrocity, these terrorists committed it. And it took the army more than half a day, basically, to get there and respond. Keep in mind, this country is geographically the size of, like, Fairfax County. So it shouldn't have taken that long. And the vaunted uh, intelligence service right. of, the, of Israel either got caught with their pants down or let it happen. You can choose which of those two things you that's, think is true. Ooh, that, that is a very geez. Fascist playbook 101. So the thing I said turned out to be true is that the Israeli intelligence basically knew that this attack was coming. And look, as it, all right, we got to talk about this, but we have to do it very carefully. We have to say something important here. There's a lot of like misinformation and bullshit out there talking about that Israel either, uh, planned this, orchestrated it, or whatever. That's not what we're saying, and that is not what happened. There's also some people saying that maybe they let it happen because Benjamin Netanyahu has reasons that he wanted it to happen. I can't quite go that far, but I'm not going to say that's outside the realm of the possibility. But as a general rule, never attribute to conspiracy what can easily be explained by stupidity. And in this case, that seems to be what we're dealing with. Gaza is a really small place. Israel has the ability through uh, their surveillance to basically see everything that goes on there. They can see it all from the air. They're listening in on all the, uh, the, the cellular networks, the radio networks. Uh, Hamas basically had to defeat this by stringing up copper wire and talking through their tunnels like on old school phones. That's their only way they could hide this from the Israelis. But turns out those were tapped too. Ultimately, it turns out that Hamas had this battle plan and the New York Times blew up this story. They had the plan for what became the October 7th attack for almost a decade. And they continued to refine it bit by bit by bit as they learned things about the Israelis. They lulled the Israelis into false senses of security by kind of laying low and not shooting off rockets for a while. And they just sort of like played into their politics. But all the while, there were folks inside Israeli intelligence, inside the IDF, inside Mossad, inside Shin Bet, who knew that this was going on, that they were planning this. They could see it, right? The training camps were open to the air. Everybody could see it. If you got a bulldozer in Gaza, you can't hide it from a surveillance drone, right? They can see all of that. You can see them practicing paragliders. You don't just get in a paraglider and try to fly across the border and like attack some people for your first time flying in it. You test it out a few times first. They saw all of that. The problem was, who saw all of that, Stacey? You know, this is not unprecedented in the world history of Pearl Harbor comes to mind that a lot of people thought the government knew about that and wanted it to have, you know, allowed it to happen so that they could get involved in war. Speaking of which, today's Pearl Harbor Day. I, you know, that has escaped my mind until just now. You are absolutely correct. Um, 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. In infamy. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think you're wrong, but. So, but specifically within the IDF, within the Shinbait, the folks who knew that this 
attack was imminent, or not imminent, but could possibly happen. They all had something in common, which Which you have, but I don't. So, you know, maybe it could be called, let's say if you said it, it would be assertive. If I said it, it'd be aggressive. Is that what you're getting? Yes. Or if, if you said it, it would be bossy. And if I said it, it would be leadership. Correct. Yes. If I said it, it's an old wives tale. If you said it, it's science. Science. That's right. Yes. So everybody who knew about this, there were women. And and the the commanders who noticed this imminent attack were like, hey, we ought to do something about this. And the uh, folks who they reported to waved them off. And they were given a bunch of excuses, right? They were told, no, 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 Hamas is these plans that you've intercepted and have dead to right and can attribute to everybody involved and is very clearly what's going on. It's aspirational. They're not really, they don't mean to do this. They're just writing stories to inspire themselves or, or something, you know, like you do, you just write battle plans for fun. Um, you don't, I, well, I guess maybe you, well, you probably (laughs) no comment, but, uh, (laughs) Different kinds of battles. Yeah. I'm not going to. No, not commenting. Okay. But (laughs) there's also like uh, some question about, oh, well, I see you think that they have bulldozers and paragliders and are drilling uh, how to attack these kibbutzim in plain sight in their uh, training camps that you can definitely see from your helicopter hovering over them. But also they're not capable of that, silly lady. And the silly lady was like, well, they seem pretty capable. I mean, I'm watching them do it. And they're like, no, no, no. Why don't you go back to, you know, Bacon Hollow or whatever? And maybe, maybe you don't know what a bulldozer is supposed to look like. Yeah, right. Maybe you just think that's a bulldozer. That's, that's really a a tractor or something like it. You know, a lot of problems in this world would go away if people started listening to women, and I will live by that till I die. Yeah, I will right. die Until on that. Hill. Stops listening to you when you're saying like I'm having a heart attack, and they go, "No, no, you're just a little verklempt or whatever." Like it's it's it just is, heartburn. Yeah, right. You, women don't get heart attacks, of course they don't. Like, like come on, Miss Elizabeth. <laughs> right. Yes. It's it's so. This is like several of the things that are this show kind of all at once, right? Here we have, uh, let's put the fascism aside because we're about to get to that. So like there's, there's, there's fascism problem. We'll talk about that. Ignoring people who have good information because they are of a different group than the like hetero men that run the world that's a stupid mistake. And it like, it needs to stop. It, keeps <laughs> it happens it, it, a lot. It happens a lot. And it just should not at all. Like from a historical funny. perspective, it's happened a lot. <laughs> over and over and over. Right. We were talking before yes. the show a little bit off air about the, the, the Greek uh, myth of Cassandra. Right. And, here she is telling everybody like, Hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a soothsayer. I can see what's about to happen. Something bad is about to happen. Everybody should listen to me. And they all go, no, 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 you're a woman. You don't know what you're talking about. And then it comes true and they all, you know, pay for the thing. And like the few men that survive the catastrophe say at the end of that myth or story, I don't know. It's probably, maybe it's true. Go, Oh, we should have listened to you. If we had only been a little more open and willing to listen to you, we we could have saved all, you know, the whole city and and everything would have been fine. And we're, you know, now we're paying for this for the rest of eternity. And that was 5,000 years ago. And 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 we have learned. And nobody learned anything from it. (laughs) And the whole point of all of those stories was so that people would learn things. Yeah, like it's not like the Greeks wrote down these myths, like for fun, like they're not, they're not fun. They're, they're supposed to be stories to like teach you something in case you don't know, you know, 
You don't want to confront that in real life, right? You don't want to find out your sister knows more than you. So that's fine. So you find out that there's a story where some other, you know, woman knew more than the men around her. And you can be like, okay, well, it's like Cassandra. You don't have to take, you don't have to take the blame. You have to be like, oh. Makes you, makes you wonder why they had to write like Oedipus. Like, don't marry your mother. Mm-hmm. That was something we needed oh, to learn. Not interrogating that question at all. <laughs> Different story. But yes, all throughout history. People have not listened to those who were not already in power. And it has created a lot of problems. And so every once in a while, you get somebody who does, and then they're known as like this amazing person who had all these ideas. But in reality, they just listened to other people. All they did was listen. All they, yeah. you know, and, and the, the great leaders in all of history are mostly great because they they bothered to listen. That that seems well, I heard something interesting. interesting about this the other day that it said think of everybody you think who's like accomplished amazing things in their life. Someone else was doing their laundry. That's true. In my wife's and case it's me. This was blowing my mind because the only way you can kind of accomplish all these amazing things is if someone else is kind of cleaning and cooking and doing all these things for you. So People who have accomplished what we would call great things are usually men or people who were extremely wealthy and had other people to do that. That's true. And it it blew my mind. I have a degree in history and that blew my mind. Well, you have a a ladies degree in history. So, I mean, it's from DePaul. Yeah. They don't play high school basketball. I only got half of it at Purdue. It's okay. Whatever. (laughs) All right. All right. So the other thing that we need to talk about, not going to let football ruin this. Is um is the fascism aspect of this? So like yes. yes, the the men who were in charge of of the Israeli defenses didn't listen to the women, but also there's this other thing, which this week the Israeli courts reopened. They were closed because of the emergency of the attack, which makes sense, right? And You know, you think, all right, well, so courts are back open. Cool. You know, criminals are going back on trial. You know, uh, people with their traffic tickets, you know, they can they can get it handled. Somebody else is in court. Who's in who's in court this week? It's BB. The prime minister. Yeah. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu, he's he's in court. He's facing like a million indictments for corruption because uh, he's very corrupt and, and he's a, he's a criminal. And so I really thought you were going to talk about Trump when you were talking about no, we'll get in court that. and fascism. I thought that's where we the were going. Same thing. Okay. So the clip that Brian played was right before I got on to this thing about why BB might want a war to happen, which is to say, the government in Israel is barely hanging on. It's made up of, of a weird fractured coalition of far right wing extremists and their right wing allies who are slightly less extreme than they are. It sounds a little familiar. And like they're they are by their actual behavior fascist. Now, I want to be clear about this. I'm Jewish and I'm telling you this right now. You can be Jewish and be fascist. Benjamin Netanyahu is fascist. His government is fascist. You cannot be Jewish and be a Nazi. Those are not the same thing. So when you hear the the Republicans in America talking about how Zelensky, who's the president of Ukraine and is Jewish, is a Nazi, no, he isn't. And he can't be because that's impossible. When you hear people like me tell you that Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israeli government is acting like a fascist government, that can't be anti-Semitic because they're not. What they are is authoritarian and fascist. Those things are not the same. And you need to decouple and understand what those words mean. Benjamin Netanyahu is running an authoritarian fascist government. He is supporting racists in the West Bank who are trying to to eradicate Palestinians 
in, in order to seize their land and, and expand their territory with no legal jurisdiction whatsoever, that's fascist. He's penalizing people for dissent, that's fascist. He's trying to unmake the judiciary, which caused riots in the streets of Tel Aviv, that's fascist. Benjamin Netanyahu is a fascist. And his government is made up of people who are even more extreme than he is. They are fascists. And what do they need to keep the rest of the Israeli population off their ass and calling for a new new election? Because remember, they're parliamentary and they can just call snap elections. And they did. Well, you have a war. You have an like emergency. Dog. You have some reason to suspend general order and create some different governance structure. And then maybe you just kind of keep that going for a decade. It's very Machiavellian. It's exactly that. And excellent movie. Wag the dog. It's exactly that. Except it's real this time in that movie. It's a fake war that they made digitally and like, you know, with, with movie tricks and stuff. And in this case, It looks like, and I'm not saying this is exactly what happened, but it does look like the folks in the Israeli government had some idea that this attack of October 7th was a possibility, a possibility. And they either allowed it to take place for their own purposes or just sort of generally waited for it to happen. For their own purposes. Their own purposes being fighting the fact that Benjamin Netanyahu is facing criminal charges in several court cases. I don't know how else to spin this, but like it is, as I said several weeks ago, fascist playbook 101. He tried to remake the judiciary. He was met with protests in the streets. If some external attack happens and it creates a situation where you can say, look, it's too dangerous to change leaders midstream. You know, he's got a wartime cabin. He's got a unity government. He's got all these things. It it just, it's hard to call it anything else. And then the way that the IDF is behaving in Gaza, I get it. You got to eliminate Hamas. Yes. You have to take away their opportunity and ability to attack Israel. Yes. But every time you bomb a hospital, no matter how many tunnels are under it, which we're about to get to, or every time you kill thousands and thousands of children, even if you eradicate all the current Hamas fighters, somebody is going to come and take their place. And you've just given them a whole lot of reason to do so. There is no good solution here apart from actual peace And I don't mean lack of war. I mean peace. I mean Palestinian sovereignty and safety and security and prosperity in a way that they don't have any reason to attack Israel. That's how Israel achieves peace, which is not what they're currently doing. You know what else? Hamas. So, you know, like the last few weeks, Israel was like bombing hospitals and everybody's like, whoa, dude, what are you doing? Like bombing hospitals, right? It's pretty fucked up. You shouldn't be bombing hospitals. You know what doesn't belong in a hospital? Tunnels. But you know what else doesn't belong in in a hospital? Tunnels. Or Hamas. Or terrorist command and control facilities. I think it's really hard to figure out like what what is actually the story there. Well, it's not that because the tunnels are there, right? Yeah. Israelis watched these tunnels be built. Let let me make something clear. Remember what I said. The Israelis can see everything happening in Gaza. Everything. Right. If you get dominoes in Gaza, they know. They're like, what are you doing? Get pepperoni. That's not kosher. Like they 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 tap the phone line. They know. Okay, so when they saw cement trucks pouring cement into a hole in the ground, they're like, oh, what are you doing with all that cement in the hole in the ground? Well, they're building a goddamn tunnel. That's what they're doing. Hamas has built 300 miles of tunnel in a place that's only 25 miles long. 
That's from one end and back several times. Okay. They can do that, and they, they've been doing it, and the Israelis watched them do it, and they saw where the, all the shafts are. There's hundreds and hundreds of these tunnel shafts all over Gaza, and the Israelis have found, documented, and videoed hundreds of them. Some of them happen to be under hospitals, children's hospitals, no less. Under UN shelters, under schools, under places that they know that they know you shouldn't bomb. Why did they do that? Because they think that that's gonna provide them some sort of security. So both, both sides of this conflict are basically saying they don't give a shit about the lives of the people in Palestine. The Israelis will bomb them indiscriminately because they're focused on their security. You gotta eradicate the bad guys who are hucking rockets at you. You gotta go after the people who brutally attacked raped and pillaged, carried off your people, kidnapped them. You got to destroy that. You got to. If that happened to you, you do it too, right? However, how how dare you bomb our hospitals? It's our, our wounded, our, our people are, are sick and dying. The children, the babies, and the, the NICUs who built the tunnels under the hospitals. Israelis didn't build tunnels under the hospitals. Hamas built the tunnels under the hospitals. They bear some of that responsibility too. Nobody's right here. And as we said before on this show several times, it is okay to say that this is tragic. It is okay to weep for the lives of the children in Palestine who have been killed by the bombs of the IDF. And it is also okay to be crying and and apoplectic about the hostages that have been captured by Hamas. And it is okay for people on both sides of this conflict, Jewish, Arab, or otherwise, to say the loss of life is tragic. It doesn't mean you're supporting one side over the other, but you can be very clear that the loss of life is tragic and you can do something about it, which is to say you can funnel your resources if you have them to people who are trying to help, whether that's the UN, whether that's Doctors Without Borders, whether that's any of the relief uh, organizations and agencies that you think can can serve uh, the people, because at the end of this, at the end of this, you have you have two groups of people, like we said before, who are being held hostage by their leaders, who they didn't have a choice in this. So there's our Israel update. And listen to women. Yeah, for fuck's sake, listen to women. <laughs> Shit, thanks, Stacey, for reminding me. Very happy. I think in your house you don't have a choice, but you know, the rest of the world. Yeah, there's there's I'm the only dude in my house, dogs included. But yeah, for God's <laughs> sakes, listen to the women. Sometimes they know what the fuck they're talking about. Would that kill you? Would it kill you? Unless you want it to happen, then you just, you know. For women to speak up takes a lot of courage. So when they do, please listen. In any culture. Also, we should give all the women in the world uh, super soakers full of hot sauce. Absolutely. Yeah. So whenever they say something and the men just like fucking ignore them, they, pfft, that's it. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. We're going to squirt some hot sauce on a snack. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk to our guest who is waiting in the bullpen, uh, Nora Shalloway Carpenter. We cannot wait. She's written all kinds of great books. Uh, it's going to be cool. Okay? So you're listening to Chip Chat on Beltway Radio and beyond. Sweeps. Miles Dawn. Let me take you on a journey through Carmel City. Carmel City, too. Listen, to Moose, um, on tour. Bubble bands on the top floor, players club, back on the concourse, let the dawn score. She came for the encore, the guard pure. Pay me hand in hand, let a player do his dance, never compromise the brand. Surfing over avalanche, she don't stand a chance, we working. Not catalog perfect, no lie. Had to level up the fly, you still pepper dry. I'm chilling course size, she brought a friend just to slide. Get it right, all this ball work. Got your bra on her skirt, you call it rhymes. Real is a merry line, made a toes curl. 
private flights out this world. Brought the feeling back. Ain't no telling what we do with rap. All the goats notice what our pens noted. Could have been the poets that I'm pulling up in Lotus. Gave them all money, Jack Frost. Yeah, I'm golden. Legendary moments got me feeling like I'm next. My voice over beats just tend to connect. Me and Names, we a threat. Doing numbers all summer, still ride through the city. Riding through the city. I still ride through the city, doing numbers all summer, still ride through the city. Carmel city too. I still slide through the city. For the day one is one to write a book on the game, take a page from us. Never give the bullshit like a maze runner. With the sample and the drum, I create summers. No room for butterflies when the revolution being televised. We don't get excited when it's low and when the market rise. Chocolate boy one until infinity. Timeless. Never chase a clock, but you remember me. A day's work deserves a day's pay. And publishing is old. Cut my check with no delay. I ain't searching for the goals or the rainbow. But I will pull up to the label like I'm Django. Paid my dues, so pay my fee. I'm so brother number one, and I need my trees. <laughs> the architect to multiple classics. To beat Muhammad Ali, first you gotta be cash. Doing numbers all summer, still ride through the city. Riding through the city. I still ride through the city, doing numbers all summer, still ride through the city. Carmel city too. I still slide through the city, doing numbers all summer, still ride through the city. Riding through the city. I still ride through the city, doing numbers all summer, still ride through the city. Carmel city too. I still slide through the city. Chip with me tonight is Stacy. Say hi to the people, Stacy. Why, hello there. I'm supposed to say hi to the people, Stacy. Hi to the people. You never seen Burns and Allen or heard of Burns and Allen or you know, say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. All right. Anyway. Let's try to bring a little class. Oh, okay. Uh <clears throat> speaking of which, uh <laughs> Nora Shalloway Carpenter is a writer who has written about everything from rural America to frogs. A little bit more on that later. Uh, it's a hot topic on this show. She has a new book out called uh, Fault Lines, which is about mental health and fracking, which there you go. Uh, Nora is also a collector of stories, and she has so many to tell us. Nora, welcome. Welcome to Chip Chat. Hi, it's so nice to be here. Thanks for having me. We're very excited to talk to you. Um, so I want to jump right into this because, you know, we did a little bit of research here. <laughs> you have several books that feature themes about rural America. Mm -hmm. so they kind of seek to present that section of the country to those of us who don't often interact with rural Americans. So the question is, what are we East Coast elites missing? I, well, I, um, that's a lot, I would say. Um, <laughs> so basically, um, this started because, so my first book that dealt with rural America specifically is Rural Voices, which is an anthology of 15 rural authors. Um, and it's a response basically to the horribleness that is Hillbilly LG, um, which was really like beloved <laughs> by um, um, most of the population who are not rural, because I think it really fit, um, you know, it, it fit what people kind of wanted to believe and thought was true. And um, there's so many problems around that book. <laughs> and while that may be like one person's story, um, Eddie Vance's story. <laughs> right. Um, you know, there, there's, there's lots of things to be said. Like he spent summers in a rural place, but like. He's not from the place that he wrote about, but he presents right. himself as if he is one of these people. Exactly. And it was very clear. I mean, the book came out and my husband was like, oh, he's going to run for office. Like this is what, you yeah. know, like, this is like not difficult to figure out. But um, what really bothered me um, was that right after that book came out, and at first I was excited because I didn't know 
you know, I was just like, oh, you know, there's going to be this, ex- this will be cool um, before I read it. And then I just started seeing like my friend, like, pe- like people that knew me that really cared about me, just like raging about rural America. And um, certainly there are a lot of problems in any place. Um, and so I don't want to say that rural um, America is without its problems because that's definitely not true. But the idea of this like rural monolith where I think if you if you talk to most people and you're like, oh, tell me about what you think a rural person is, like almost immediately they'll think of like, it, it'll come across as like a Be- uh, Beverly Hillbilly kind of, you know, like stereotype. Or- checkered flannel shirt with a giant belt buckle. And yeah, Yeah, exactly. I mean, like even like my first job, um, like first professional job um, was in Washington, DC. And I was invited, you know, super young, like early twenties and uh, was invited to this party with other work people. And, you know, somebody found out I was from West Virginia. And the very first thing they said to me was, was, oh, like, is your husband your cousin? Like that was like the first thing that was said to me. And I was so mortified. I mean, I I just like, I remember like I could feel like how red my face was. It was just like, but imagine like if you just met someone for the first time and like, that's what you say to them. Um, and so (laughs) to be clear, uh, New Jersey still allows first cousins to get married. So I just want to be clear about like where this fault line, West Virginia, you cannot marry your first cousin. No. New Jersey, you can. Listen, <laughs> it's just I'm the fact that, that I feel like, I feel like for the, for most people that that's a thing that you would find insulting or it's often. Rudy Giuliani insulting. married his cousin. <laughs> well, I don't know what, what, my God. Like, I like, don't know what you want me to say. <laughs> so do you focus mostly on Appalachia or well, like my. Really- so my redneck part of my family is in rural Missouri in the Ozarks. Yes, which yes. It's like a totally different thing than Appalachia. It's very different. So um, rural voices is all over the country. Like there's rural Alaska, there's rural, you know, Georgia, like all over. Um, rural, let's see, sorry. I'm actually, I have a new project that I can't really talk about. That's, gonna, that's well, more. We're going to ask you about new Appalachian stuff. stuff. Hold, hold that one. We won't tell okay. anybody. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, nobody watches this show anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm say. excited to be here anyway. <laughs> but um, but no, my story, my so I edit, I edited those stories, but I also wrote a short story in Rural Voices, and that story is set in rural West Virginia, very similar to where I grew up. And then my new book, Fault Lines, is set in rural West Virginia, and there are very, very few, um young adult novels set in rural West Virginia. Just to- I'm going to say it's because they don't know how to write over there, but then you're going to like, you know, put me in your next book. There as- you go. You, I feel I'm like you need going. to read rural voices. You're like the target audience. So it turns it's out perfect. there's lots of smart people from West by God, but um, <laughs> all right. So we were trying to ask this question of ourselves earlier and we couldn't figure it out. Now, now we happen to have an expert here. What do you call you know, like, so an author is somebody who writes, uh, you know, a poet writes poetry, like an anthologist collects anthologies, but like, what do you call that thing of collecting anthologies? Like that, that's not the collecting, right? Like what, so what's the word for the person? Oh, like who, curating or like, I'm an anthologist. Yeah. So what do you call that, that, that verb? What's the verb? the verb? You, I mean, you're just an editor. I think like you. I edit. Just, it, it, all right. Well, that's yeah, right. I curator. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, we yeah, wanted curator. a better answer than that. But Sorry. <laughs> I mean, like, what? Well, I mean, that's what I'm called, you know, editor, co editor. Contributing editor is when you like also write a story and edit the book. There you go. Contributing editor. We're going to yeah. call ourselves contributing editors from now on. Okay. <laughs> all right. So many of your stories uh, and collections, they center around like social justice issues. Mm hmm. Why do you think that's the thing that we need to focus on? And before you answer that with like, well, obviously, because it fucking sucks. You can just like say, can can you give us like a better, better than what we would say about a it? better answer than than clearly? That's what yes. because we're people in the world and we should care about others. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. So I think specifically for because my um 
my readership is targeted towards teens, upper teens, um, and college age, but often I was, but very much still goes into adult. Um, but specifically for that age, because I, I think that, you know, those are the people that are making things happen in the world. And I think we need to like, give them, give them hope be in a, in a very hopeless time. And so that's why I do what I do. And I have to admit that it's, you know, it's very difficult on some days, on many days right now. Um, but at, but at Texas, least, though, by the way, like a slight sorry? victory. Shout out to Texas and a slight victory in courts today. Oh, mm -hmm. The yeah. lady get some health care. We're getting to text. We're getting to Texas later. You got a whole thing about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, what do what does rural America get wrong about us city folks? Because I yeah. know this like talking to my relatives, but interested to hear as you have. I'm I have you know, rural relatives in one very, very tiny part of the country. And so as okay. someone who's talked to a broader spectrum. Okay. So I would say, I mean, a lot too. I think the, I think it's very, in, in some ways it's almost, um, you know, like political parties or any, any, any kind of dichotomy where you're putting like, where you have us and the other. So a lot of rural people, because of the place that they're tied to, um, are, I, I would say there's like a lot of fear and so kind of have this idea that these elite people don't understand them and are going to try and take things away from them. And so there's just a lot of misunderstanding. And so um, I think one of the biggest things that I try to show, especially with fault lines, is that there are much bigger things at play. Like, you, like you can, you can be angry all you want. And certainly I am too, um, for the way that a lot of rural areas vote, but like, let's break down like why, who's actually in charge here? Who, who's putting these ideas out there? Who's capitalizing on this right. fear, um, of, a, of mostly people from lower economic and, and a lot of, instances lower economic um, who's taking advantage of people who don't have the wherewithal i mean that, yes. that's the thing that we talk about on the show all the time it, right it, and well i was just i was so interested in what stacy was saying earlier when i was listening in about like this whole idea that people that do great things it's because they have somebody else that's doing other things for them or it matters right and so it's like if you're focused on how am i going to feed my family how am I going to just like keep my job and keep my house or keep whatever, you know, like you don't have the ability to really think of other things beyond that in, in terms of like, um, so if we get into like environmental issues, which is definitely, which is super into fault lines too. So there's a lot of like rural environmentalism, which where I grew up in rural West Virginia, fracking was going on, lots of things were going on. And so there were kind of like these two camps, right? Like the people that were like super against fracking. And then the people that were like, Hey, this is like providing me some money. And you know, like they're like the whole economics. And it's like, um, I think we have to understand why people think the way they do and then who is feeding them this information and in, in most cases, misinformation, right? And that's often like people that are in the 1%, right? The top, the very top, and that are capitalizing on these um, fears and insecurities. And so though, like this is a systemic problem that we have to go after. And and just like access, there's so much stuff about, um, like there's this great organization called Rural Minds, which did not, certainly didn't exist, you know, um, when I was in high school or anything, but it's all about like how, like, mental health care in rural America. Like, first of all, there's just not places to go. So you think about like the skyrocketing numbers all over the world since, since COVID has happened. Right. And people like with the anxiety and depression and all this stuff and people in rural places, like don't have places to go. Like they don't like, or, um, doctors that are young and, 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 no, a lot more, you know, like for those, those hippies in San Francisco. And shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, Wait, I have to do, I have to do a shout out to my sister who is a mental health professional in rural America. So yay, that's <laughs> I'm sure she is like overwelmed. I, I was really she is incredibly overwhelmed. <laughs> yes. 
I mean, <laughs> honestly, it was interesting to see in my own family um, what happened when like a new younger, I mean, young by younger, I mean, you know, mid thirties, upper thirties yeah. um, professional, a doctor moved in and took over this practice from this like 85 year old white man. Right. And like the, the difference of care that my family got and was all of a sudden was like, oh my gosh, I think you might be, you know, suffering from anxiety. Like, let's do something about this. Like let's evidence-based this care. Out. What are you talking about? I what? know. I know. So um, that's witchcraft. Yeah. <laughs> so right. one thing yeah. I've noticed is most of the mental health stuff in rural America, at least in my own experience, um, having family there is very centered around addiction. And oh, yeah. if you're not an addict, then you don't have any problems. Have yeah. you, did, what have you seen since you're talking about mental health in rural America? I mean, so my experience with mental health in, in so we we have we do have addiction like in my extended family that i there have that has happened um everyone but, does yes but my um what i deal with mostly is not addiction it's you know it it's in fact i have another anthology called um absolutely normal which is all about mental health <laughs> short stories um and so i personally have ocd and um i you know it's it's, I don't want to say it's easy for me to get care, but like it, it's e uh, way easier. And there are less barriers. Yes, there are a lot <laughs> less barriers. And, but, but like when I, um, mine was kind of, you know, I, I was, it was very trauma induced. Like it, you can kind of, you can kind of be like on the trajectory of OCD, you know, and then all of a sudden that you have, you have something happens and it kind of like tips you over the edge, which is what happened with me. And I didn't know, um, I didn't know what was happening. And so I think like, and, and if you're in a place and, and just the fact, like I was in an urban center when that happened and like the difficulty that it took me to get like proper care and figure that out, you know, I mean, it was just like, oh my gosh. Like, so you my if you're in a place with less access and you had it's, somebody exactly. with less, less uh, familiarity with the system, I mean, right. Well, even, even if you have familiarity, you just can't get it. Like even in, so I'm in right. Asheville, North Carolina right now, and people cannot get mental health care. Like, and that's a know, city where people are like street corner therapists. Like yes. there's so much people think of, of Asheville as like Berkeley East, you know, yes. and, and, yeah. and it's still hard. And I mean, like, especially like with this, like the schools, like there are so many kids, I have three kids. And so, you know, we know a lot of kids and like so many kids are on waiting lists. Doctors are like, mm -hmm. I know a doctor that is taking kids up. His last appointment is 8 PM. I mean, like, you know, these people are going above and beyond trying to help. And you can't like do that for an extended period of time. You can't burn yourself out. Like there's so anyway, all that is magnified in a rural place. And so um, and my first book, The Edge of Anything, is has that kind of that's kind of what it one so of the one themes of, the of it. This, this kind of makes me think about is it's like, you know, the. The quote that got cut. When Hillary said we're going to put a lot of coal miners out of work, but she, but there's the second half of that sentence, which is and get them better jobs. Yeah, right. And and that got so badly misinterpreted. But most of the time, when I talk to people from these regions, you know that environmentalism is is huge, right? These these yeah. are people who are tied to the land, so they talk about. Oh yeah, these these assholes are dumping stuff in the in the water. They're messing up the the soil. You know, yeah. they're spraying this stuff on the crops. It's killing things. You know, the coal miners are uh, the the slag that from the mills is dumping everywhere. It's you know they, they're very keen about the danger mm -hmm. of of heavy industry interacting with nature. They're, they mm -hmm. they seem to be really keen on that. And then you you ask them like, well what we ought to do about that. And they go, well, I got to make some money and feed my family while I can. And I'll worry about that stuff later. And right. that, that is it's a hard compromise for people to make, but the urban equivalent thereof 
is people who say, well, yeah, this gentrification is bad, or they say that you know these mm-hmm. these dollar stores are bad, or they say drug dealing is bad, and you say, well, yeah, but I gotta I gotta sell drugs so I can feed my family, and and both sides are getting demonized here by groups who seem to be able to ignore the fact that people are doing what they have to do because they're they're stuck in a situation not of their own making, yes, and they have no other choice but to operate in that circumstance. Right. And I mean, it's, they're dehumanized basically. It's, it? It, yes. It's easy to, it, it's easy to judge and hate on people that are not like that you don't really consider people. Like if you don't hear individual stories, it's when we hear ind- people's individual stories and you're like, Oh, I could see how, if maybe I was actually in that same situation, I, I would have made that same choice, you know? Um, but we've just gotten so divided as a society in every, in every way that we, we're not making, we can't move forward. I mean, look at our ridiculous government right now that can't, you know, like. (laughs) I mean, I think, I, I think that, that what you said there about individual stories really matters because once people have some personal connection to something that happened, they're able to say, well, you know, that might be true of a lot of people, but I know a guy who had, or I know somebody who had, so it's hard to hate up close. It is oh, yes. very yes. difficult. So, so like as you're collecting these stories, are you thinking about how to present the the humanity of marginalized or dehumanized groups to the greater, uh, you know, to the greater culture, to the greater oh, group? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes even to myself, like in Fault Lines, there's two characters. There's one who um, is from rural West Virginia, like her family, generations tied to the land, right? And fracking has come in and it's destroyed something that's really, really important to her. So she's like on this anti-fracking campaign. And then there's another character who his mom, you know, is a veteran. She's a single mother and she has finally gotten a job with a pipeline company. Um, and that's what brings them to this small town. And this is, this job is like keeping them off the street basically. So it's like their, their lifeline. And so, you know, some of the arguments in order to make him real, in order to bring him to life, I had to like confront some of my own biases too. Right. And that, and, and both characters do that in the novel, because I think it's, you you know, you run a real danger and, and it's so easy to like hate on people from social media too, because you're not like, you know, you say all these things that if you were talking to an actual person, you would never say, um, but I think like we we have to learn collectively, all of us, how to talk to people that have differing views from us and and not just shout over them, but actually listen. You guys were talking about listening to women earlier, like listen to what they're saying, to why their views. And then you can start and change hearts and minds by having discussions and coming together and hopefully and then coming up with new solutions, right? Because clearly what, like, we're just in a stalemate in so many ways right now and it, things are not getting better. Um, and hopefully like what I hope my stories do is, is allow the readers, you know, to kind of live vicariously through these characters and then translate that into their, their lives going forward. I think That's the goal. I think that, uh, you know, when you get some commonality with somebody, even if it's something real minor, Mm -hmm. it's so when you go, oh, yeah, that happened to me, too. Then then they're like, oh, okay, All right. So, you know, like it it bridges the gaps. Um, So let's talk about, uh, you know, bridge is like a yoga position. That's one (laughs) of the things I've learned. You have a book about frog yoga. I do. Well, Uh, it's. I mean, it's just yoga, but a frog does it. So there's a, it's frog yoga. So noted frog scientist Alex Jones is very worried about how the woke libs are making all the frogs gay. Uh, your response? Oh, um, I I admit I'm unprepared for this question. <laughs> That's the correct response. <laughs> uh, okay. Yoga has nothing to do with sexual preference of. Frogs. Right. <laughs> All frogs can do yoga. <laughs> All frogs can love who they love. Love who they love. There you go. 
right. Uh, so your your new book, uh, which you, you you've referenced a little bit, uh, uh, Fault Lines, it's about people impacted by fracking. Mm-hmm. How did you gather the stories and the research uh, about this without going totally nuts? Because it seems like a really complicated, as you've already sort of alluded to, there's no like clear cut right answer here. Right. I mean, if there was, I feel like we would have moved moved beyond. We would have found right. it, right? Um, so a lot of it, uh, like I said, you know, I grew up in the northern panhandle of West Virginia. And uh, when I was, you know, um, fracking came in, I guess, I'm trying to think if I was like maybe 14 or so when it started, 13. Um And so a a lot of, I know a lot of people that were impacted by it. You know, I talked to friends, I talked, I interviewed some people that um, work for the pipeline company in West Virginia, you know, like um, just basic on the ground research like that you would do. And then, uh, and then obviously read um, nonfiction books about the science and, and, and what has happened in lawsuits and stuff and all of that, you know, um, to have a good background of both sides. Um, and, and then, and then it's just a lot, you know, then you go about fictionalizing, you know, what the story, like what's happening. And so pulling different pieces, um, of all of that and, and putting it into, you know, a story of my, of my own creation. Did you ever get a chance to talk to anybody whose water caught on fire? No. I did not. However, I we had um, a, a a pipeline explode about like a mile from my house. Oh, sure, that's um, cool. Yeah. So my mom, I was actually at a, at volleyball practice. I was I was in high school, and it was on the weekend, and so we were downtown, you know, like fifteen minutes away in my small little town. And my mom comes racing into the gym with my little sister and all like we had three dogs at the time, all the dogs are in the van. And so and we found out later because it was a national story. And we found out later that you could see the explosion from airplanes like 30,000 feet oh, wow. above. Yeah. And it was so hot that the firefighters told us that like it melted the um, their their wheels like when they went to like go and it it was miraculous that no one was hurt. Like there was a house very close by and they got a settlement, which was like pathetic, you know, but like, and and that's another thing too, where if you read about um, actual court cases and like (laughs) the difference that people are paid and they want each name, they want neighbors to like not talk about money because that's not polite, but really it's because like you have this one person over here that's paid like a ridiculous, you know, it has made wealthy and then everybody else is paid peanuts basically for what things are actually worth. But that's, that's like a whole nother issue. But um, yeah, luckily no one was. You was can see hurt. from airplanes is never a good selling point. No, 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 that was, um, so yeah, so we were like right in the thick of it and, and I have to say it got to the point where, um, I mean, my parents lived in, in that, in their house for 30 years and they finally moved down, um, down to North Carolina, they're older and, um, just for medical reasons and stuff, it, it made sense. But um, it got to the point where when I was an adult, I couldn't go back there. Like I, I, it was so, the land was so devastated, like what had happened that it was just painful to return home. Like, like it was just, place anymore. no. And like it, it, you would just hear, you could hear, like there'd just be like this constant, like, like, because of this, you know, thing that's a ridge over, but, but, but you could hear it. I mean, it was just awful. And, and one of the reasons, you know, the argument is like, okay, well, we need power. We need these, you know, we need these things to live. So let's, and of course, if you put them in rural places where most of you know, the people making big decisions don't have to see them, don't have to deal with all that stuff. You know, that's easy to overlook. It's easy to make those judgments when you're not living with 
all the all the, well, yuck, the people yes, impacted right? are, are poor or you know dehumanized or whatever it doesn't exactly. really matter to to exactly right and a lot of and this and this idea of like well they could just move you know i mean that's just <laughs> like it's just that's not that's not it's real it's not practical <laughs> you know you, like if like really a lot in a lot of cases what people have their only resource is the land you know <laughs> like is is their property and um and so if it becomes you know unhealthy if they can't use it or they have to leave i mean that's a whole that's terrible so they actually there's a lot of documented cases where people stay in unsafe environments because they they it's literally like cannot move. they have no other place to go right. um so yeah so there's there's it is definitely not a black and white issue and um we need we it's certainly something that needs to um change because you know i'm definitely not advocating like we just have to leave everything alone no 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 like definitely we need to change things but we can't like you say we have to include the second part of the quote you can't take away someone's livelihood before you give them a replacement you know that is that is as um meaningful like that that's good work you know that 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 is like makes them feel like they're contributing really, supporting right their supporting their family <laughs> like not working at well oh, yeah. i don't know there's not even like really a good example but um anyway yeah that's my whole spiel step back I'm off all right so so where can everybody get your books and stuff uh <laughs> Is the is the fault lines out or is it? It is, is it yes. It came out in September. Yeah, okay. it just actually got um, it just got selected to be on the Texas um, Tayshaws list, which is this big state um a state book list for the whole state of Texas, which is really really exciting. Um, so yeah, you can get it anywhere that books are sold. Um, you can get it at your favorite indie bookstore, which is always the best. <laughs> Always. But you can also get it online. So, um, yeah. And where can everybody follow you so that they can stay up to date and know when you're going to do? Also, I wasn't aware Texas had book awards. I thought they were very against books over there. But I was yeah, going to ask not, if you were not, banned. No, yeah. well, so Texas is so interesting. They, um, the librarians in Texas, have so much power. They're kind of like the lead. They're like the leaders of. Who knew? I there's just. You There's know? librarians in Texas. Oh my gosh, so many! But do you, well, we're I learning can, so much. Yes, and I just have to say real, real quick here that I am like because I'm just so upset about it. But basically, West Virginia has eliminated like every school librarian position in the whole state. So that's shocking. That, but also no more. I will go on a rant about that as a public school teacher anytime. Yeah, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Why um, doesn't Greg Abbott stand up for for West for or for uh, Texas librarians? He should stand up for them. He doesn't do that. <laughs> All right, yeah, you that that Where can you everybody get it. your uh, get your stuff? Um, so my following me on Instagram is probably the best. Um, and I'm at Nora Carpenter Writes. And you can also just go on my website, um, NoraCarpenterWrites.com, and I have all my info on there so yeah all right cool well we're about to tag in a bunch of stuff because all next week there's going to be lots of clips of this show where we're saying awesome. ridiculous things and you're going to be tagged along uh -huh. Wonderful. very informative <laughs> i've learned a ton stacy how much have you learned today i have learned a lot i have brought up all of my teacher training on hierarchy of needs has like regurgitated yes. Yes. um mm -hmm. as someone who you know taught public school in a very poor urban area um i'm seeing a lot of parallels so yeah my brain started working which and i think i love what you say amazing. there like because there are so many parallels <laughs> which I think so when much. people read the stories, they're like, oh my gosh, like my life is so different from this person, but also so similar, you know? Hierarchy of needs are hierarchy of needs, no matter where you live. Exactly. Yep. Right. Totally. So, all right. Top on the hierarchy of needs, of course, is this show. So uh, <laughs> one more time before we take a break, Nora, where can everybody uh, follow you on the Instagrams and all that stuff? Yeah. So that is at Nora Carpenter writes. 
on Instagram. And then my website is norakarpenterwrites.com. All right, great. We're going to tag you in a bunch of stuff. We need to take a break because we have the third half of this show to get to, which is going to be fantastic. I'm told I haven't read, read the script, but it's going to be good. Uh, all right. Thank you, Nora. We know it's a school night. Uh, we got to get moving on. Thank you to everybody who's tuning in to hear her. Now you're going to hear more of the show. We're going to take a break. You're listening to Chip Chat on Beltway Radio and beyond. Sweeps. Thank you. I'm sick of all these witches and warlocks. They're full of shit. Pumpkin possums. I'm sick of it. You keep interrupting me. And all of it's locked because you're lying. That's why. Oh, there's energy. And oh, now we're done with trolls. You said he was the Messiah. You said he was invincible. I will not suffer your cure people after this. I know what you are day one. I know what you are now. Witches and warlocks. are full of shit. Pumpkin possums. I'm sick of it. You keep and all of it's lost because you're lying. That's why every goddamn thing out of your people's mouth doesn't come true. You said it was all over. You told us to stop. You. <laughs> Witches and warlocks, you're full of shit. Pumpkin and popsums, I'm sick of it. You keep interrupting me. And all of it's lies because you're lying. That's why. Witches and warlocks are full of shit. Pumpkin and popsums, I'm sick of it. You keep interrupting me. And all of it's lies because you're lying. That's why. Because every god thing. I don't want to see him kissing goblins, ingratiating goblins, in bed with a goblin. I don't want to see him kissing goblins, succubus with goblins, ingratiating goblins. In the bed with a goblin. I don't want to see him kissing goblins. Goblins. Ingratiating goblins. In bed with a goblin. I don't want to see him kissing goblins. Kissing goblins. Ingratiating goblins. Ingratiating goblins. In bed with a goblin. In bed with a goblin. Dump it. Charging into a goblin's nest. Some goblin vomit. Slopping blood on it. Especially up to his ankles. Trump charging into a goblin's nest. Some goblin vomit. Slop. Goblin vomit. Slop. I'm not expecting him to not get dirty. Slop. Kissing goblin. Kissing goblin. Ingratiating goblin. Ingratiating goblin. Succubus with goblin. Succubus with goblin. Bad with a goblin. Bad with a goblin. Kissing goblin. Kissing goblin. Ingratiating goblin. Ingratiating goblin. I just want to catch him in bed. Bad with a goblin. 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 All right, welcome back to Chip Chat here on Beltway Radio and Beyond. I'm your host, Chip. With me tonight is Stacy. Hello. Hello. Stacy, how'd you <laughs> like our guest? Uh, that was fascinating. I learned a lot. Yeah. Turns out smart people come on the show. Did you know that? <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> Nobody else did either. Speaking of which, uh, it's worth doing a little promo for next week. Joining us next week uh, on the schedule, I don't know how the producers of this show manage this, is uh, is recently retired from NPR uh, and his tiny desk, Bob Boylan, is going to be on Ooh. is on the show. Yeah, so we can't Did you know uh, our last guest uh, received an NPR endorsement yeah, for one of her books was on the npr book list yes that's very true yeah, i recently just read that may or may not have been how we got in contact with her. so um in any case yeah so bob boylan's going to be here next week and uh we're going to ask him about his band and his uh his new not new his his other radio show on uh tacoma radio low power which i think you might be able to pick up where you live so um if you yeah. if you do Tacoma's like a block and a half away yeah, so you should you should definitely be able to tune in. Also, shout out to uh, the Tacoma Torch, by the way. Great new article just this week about what happened there with the uh, with the famous parking lot at Tacoma Junction, which will remain a parking lot thanks to the steadfast environmentalism of the people who have lived there for twenty years, as opposed to the people who have lived there for fifteen years. Okay, uh, moving on. Tacoma Park is a caricature of itself. Uh, we are on from our last segment, which was about the Israeli right, onto the American right. Now, quick, 
quick updates here. There was a GOP debate yesterday. That was pure silliness. Absolutely not worth paying any attention to. Uh, including because no one did. Nobody did. And uh, <laughs> they had like when, four guys that watched. Nikki Haley was like, uh, "No, I'm not going to respond to that. It's not worth my time." So that that tells you everything you need to know about it. Uh, Trump, that guy who used to be president, he thinks he's still president, but maybe about to be president, and sometimes thinks he's both at the same time. Um, he told everybody that he would be a dictator. But only for a day, which I'm not sure how that works, because like once you dictate things, it's like that that's a thing. Um, we were all just a little impressed he put the word tater at the end. It's cause... correct. Well, and didn't finish it with tot. Uh, I thought he would have gone so much there. So much. He made Hannity laugh a bunch because he was like, Yeah, I tell Hannity what to do, and he doesn't tell me what to do. And Hannity was like, ha ha ha, yes, sir. That was pretty funny. <laughs> and uh and that guy, what's his name? Devolder. What was his drag name? I don't know. He had a few. Santos. He got he got kicked out of the house. He forgot his name already? No, no, I didn't forget his name. I forgot all of his other aliases. We we had some good names. What were some of our better names for him? He had, you know, he had all his drag names. We had like a whole oh, episode those drag names. Yeah. yeah. I mean, isn't that a little insulting to the drag yeah. community? It, that's right. So when we come back after the Christmas break, uh, Brian traditionally does a clip show special where he plays us clips of our previous clips. And uh, our job is to guess the file name of those clips, which is usually much funnier than whatever we guess. I have listened to that show. Yeah, it's pretty good. All right, so that's... You don't do very well, usually. No, we we lose at that game every time. (laughs) Uh, All right, so that's that's the stuff that we don't have time to talk about. Here's what we're going to talk about. Texas, Dateline, Austin. There's a a Texas uh, Republican Party. Do you know about that? Is there any other party in Texas? Yeah, it turns out, but doesn't matter about them. Right now, we're talking about the Texas Republican Party, which may or may not be in charge of all facets of government in Texas. Two months after a prominent conservative activist and fundraiser was caught hosting white supremacist Nick Fuentes, leader, leaders at the Republican Party of Texas have voted against, against barring the party from associating with no Nazi sympathizers and Holocaust deniers. Well, yeah, or else who would they talk to? Right. In a 30- Those are all the people that give them money. It gets much worse. In a 32 to 29 vote on Saturday, members of the Texas GOP's executive committee stripped a pro-Israel resolution of a clause that called for the party to confront its ties to groups that have recently employed or associated with outspoken white supremacists and extremists. In October, the Texas Tribune published photos of Fuentes, an avowed admirer of Hitler, who has called for a, quote, holy war against Jews, holy shit, entering and leaving the offices of one of these consulting firms that works with the Texas Republicans. So here's what happened. They were like, yo, we need to pass a resolution that says we support Israel in destroying uh, Gaza because they didn't say like destroying Hamas and restoring, you know, dignity to the Palestinian people. They were just like, we support Israel full stop. And then some of them were like, maybe we ought to make sure we don't hang out with anybody who wants to kill all the Jews. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. So they voted against it. Then, then they had another vote. I think we ought to publish who voted against this and who didn't. And they were like, whoa, 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 whoa. They voted that down too. I mean, we're back to hierarchy of needs, right? Like, if this party wants to survive, the people they depend on are not nice people. Yes, yes. But this this encapsulates and highlights this thing that we have been talking about on this show for a while, which is when you've got... People like Texas Republicans, Ted Cruz, 
Greg Abbott, Dan Patrick, all these guys who say stuff like we support Israel, but when they have an opportunity to say, and we don't support Nazis, they go, no, 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 no. So it needs to be made crystal, like Pepsi clear, that when these fucking guys say they support Israel, but they can't say they don't support Nazis, they don't support Jewish people or Israel. Like, you've got to be clear. It's a little sad you have to spell that out. I feel like that should be pretty evident, but I guess not. Fellow tribes people, join me over at camera only one. Um, Guys, these are not our friends. I keep telling you that. Here they are literally voting on whether we should be or should not. They are not our friends. Take their money. Let them give us the money. That's fine. We'll need missiles, clearly. But also, they're not our friends. And don't be out here associating with these uh, Jews for Jesus or these other sort of right-wing Nazi idiots. They're out here. Attorney General Ken Paxton recently impeached Attorney General Ken Paxton, who just managed to avoid getting impeached because his wife was sleeping with God knows who. He was like, no, 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 no. We don't need to tell anybody who voted to keep the names of the Nazis off of our books. It's fine. That's a problem. It's a problem. If you're Jewish and in Texas, leave. Run. Come here. We'll hide you. It's Maryland. How many are, are there Jews in Texas? Like yeah. more than a few? Are there is there a strong Jewish presence in Texas? I, I honestly have no idea. Mm, I try to avoid the entire state all the time. Yeah, I, I think uh I think there was. Uh but they, they left when they when when it turned out that that the other people showed up. And they were like, Oh, we gotta go. Right. I don't know. Isn't I grew up in New Mexico. I've hated Texas since childhood. Yeah. Well, so, New Mexico's not a lot better. I'm not just, saying it is. I'm just saying we're taught from a young age to despise the entire Texas. state. Yes, that's understandable. Time. Yeah, I think most of what used to be the Big Twelve knows to hate Texas. All right. Speaking of things to hate, January sixth. Uh, got a little update here, Brian. I think you might have added this to the uh, to the script here. Yep. This is about uh, your favorite swimmer. How do you say his first name? Like Cleet? 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 I think it's Cleet Keller. Yeah, Cleet Keller, yeah. His name is Cleet. As in Cletus. Look at this guy. He's a real winner. He is a winner, right? He's a bronze medal. He winner. actually is a winner. <laughs> He's also... He has won things. Definitely, definitely won a, a medal and definitely uh, stormed the Capitol. He was, he was convicted. What, what's he doing now, Brian? Well, he is... <laughs> uh, he did get convicted, but the thing is, his sentence is a, a, a probational one, though. Yeah. That, that, that was the weird thing, but it will be up to at least uh, 18 months, I believe. Yeah, they wanted 10 months in prison and said he's got a year and a half of probation. Apparently, he was really an Olympic gold medalist. Well, you know... It's not like he's in a real sport like curling. <laughs> Speaking of real things, in a new court filing, prosecutors working for special counsel Jack Smith went further than they did in their August indictment in attempting to tie Trump to the riot. They said that at Trump's criminal trial in Washington, currently scheduled to be in March, which pin in that because there was just an appeal filed and a bunch of legal garbage yeah. back and forth, really, uh, that might delay that. <clears throat> if, if you haven't noticed, he Trump's basically uh, trying to delay everything as much as he can. How does he still get lawyers? I don't under, I don't well, understand. Most of them demand their money up front, which is currently how it's it's been going. Because you know, I mean, fair it, enough. I would too. Yep. So. Uh, old Jack here is is talking about how they intend to introduce evidence of Trump's behavior 
before the 2020 presidential election and his subsequent threats to establish that his motive and intent were to subvert the election and that he sent the people to the Capitol on the 6th. It's not just that he sort of said things and they chose to go of his own volition. Quote, evidence of the defendant's post-conspiracy embrace of particularly violent and notorious rioters is admissible to establish the defendant's motive and intent on January 6th, that he sent supporters, including groups like the Proud Boys, whom he knew were angry, whom he now calls patriots, to the Capitol to achieve the criminal objective of obstructing the congressional certification, prosecutors allege in a nine-page filing. At trial, the government will introduce evidence of this conduct, including the defendant's public endorsement and encouragement of violence, and further will elicit testimony from witnesses about the threats and harassment they received after the defendant targeted them in relation to the 2020 election. Okay, so some of that that's complicated. Some of this is like obvious, right? The dude is out here publicly talking about, oh, uh, Proud Boys, you know, go attack things and I told you to do it, stand up, stand down, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But why would they introduce this now as they're getting ready to go into trial? It's because they've got something, right? And they have to give all the evidence. In the United States, trials are fair, theoretically. And so- <laughs> All right, we're going with that? Okay, cool. For white guys- uh, trials you. are sort of generally fair. And so if the prosecution has evidence, they're supposed to turn it over to the defense so that they can interrogate the evidence and be able to present a case, you know, that's equal in balance. That's the basic it's called disclosure. It is. Uh, or discovery, maybe. I think it's maybe both. But either way, I'm not a lawyer. Basically, what do they have that they now have to like discover to Trump? Uh, I'll tell you what they have. All those proud boys that played guilty to save themselves from going to prison for like a hundred years. And they've all got text messages and they've all got phone calls and they've all got all this stuff because there's no honor amongst thieves. And these guys all recorded everything. Of course. He oh yeah. They will throw each other under the bus so quick, so quickly. So they, they're all basically, what Jack Smith is is signaling is, hey, we got somebody who's about to tell everybody under oath that Trump told him to do it. And uh, you better get your ducks in a row, Hoss. Don't worry, though. Uh, Trump's spokesperson was like, uh, he will not be deterred and will continue speaking the truth to corrupt, weaponized power in law enforcement or whatever he's on about today. Hooray. I would be shocked if it was one person. I think Oh no, this sounds to me it's like a collage of I mean, he's not shy about talking about it in front of everybody. He wants the credit for this. That's right. This is like a few good men. Like he wants to say it. Yeah, he's proud of it. Yeah, he's so proud of it that I, I mean, it cannot be that hard to piece together all the things he said, plus of all this other stuff that I'm sure other people are saying to get themselves out of trouble. Right. Yeah. So, so the J6 committee basically did a lot of this work for DOJ, and then they handed the file to him, and this is this is it. I mean, we're seeing the, the results of what we all knew was already the case, right? The dude did all this shit in public, and now we've got people who are sworn to say so under oath and and the receipts and we've got the emails and the text message. I mean, it's like, you know, if if they were half as smart as they are violent, they, they probably would have got away with it. But they're just fucking, you know, man, woman, camera, TV, person, whatever. Like, they're really stupid. Trump's really stupid. He's, he's, he's like like a mob boss with eight thumbs. He's, he's just like, he can't, he can't get anything right. If he was a TV show, like if this was all fictional, no one would watch it because they'd be like, this is so unbelievable. Who wouldn't see through this guy? 
Well, it, it would be like a like a Futurama character or something. Where right. it's, it's like, you know, this is some sort of alien. It's I it's a caricature, right? Right. You would think this is a cartoon. There's no yeah. way this would be real. Well, what we learned from Liz Cheney's uh, book is that all of the House Republicans referred to him as Orange Jesus. So uh, in all of our efforts and Colbert's efforts and Kimmel's valiant efforts to give this guy a name that would stick, turns out Orange Jesus is the one that sticks. I mean, that's not even creative. No. Come on. So my kids call him what I call him, which is Dangerous Pumpkin. See, that's so much more creative. Yeah, the Dangerous Pumpkin is is bad. Uh, speaking of the Dangerous Pumpkin, this segment is called No Dummy. You can't use that in court. Uh, ever since he was indicted on charges of interfering in the 2020 election, Dangerous Pumpkin has relished the chance to use uh, the case in Washington as a venue to air his baseless claims of political fraud and whatever else. So now his current filing is that he's he wants to know what happened to these two guys who are called, quote, fence cutter bulwark and scaffold commander. So in QAnon world or whatever the fuck it's called now, they've got these videos of people that they clipped in ways to show them doing things that they think are doing this thing, but that's not really what happened at all. And the rest of the video is very clear and shows that. And they show these clips over and over and they go, look at this guy. And you go, right. Look at him. Here's the 30 seconds before and 30 seconds after. And that sort of clears it up. And they go, no, look at just these three seconds of it. And you go, Right, he's moving the bike rack out of the way. They go, right, he's clearing room. He's obviously Antifa working for the FBI and shit. And you're like, okay there, Haas. Thanks. Go see his I mean, he's, down the hall. he's still trying the, like, I'm rubber, your glue defense. And it didn't work in third grade, and it's not working now. Well, but it's worse than that, because... So, like, here's here's where this gets, the rubber hits the road. There's a guy called Maga Mike Johnson, who is nominally Speaker of the House at the moment. His razor-thin majority, and in that, we'll get to it in a little bit, allows him to do all kinds of things that the Speaker of the House can do, which includes releasing all the footage of the Capitol Police from January 6th. The Department of Justice already has all this footage. They are currently combing through all of it, and they have they have tried and convicted north of a thousand people, a thousand people for violating the law on that day alone. That's a lot. The government doesn't generally move that fast. That's a lot. Uh okay, so. Maga Mike was like, yo, we're going to release all this tape because we want to show that this was kind of no big deal and it's all fine and we're going to have maximum transparency, he says. But he's like, we can't release the tapes just yet because we got to blur out all the faces, which is exactly what you do when you're doing transparency. And uh, <laughs> I mean, in a picture, if you're making things transparent, you Never mind. I can't. I can't even begin to. He was like, "No, we don't want anybody to retaliate against him, including the Department of Justice." And and you know, none of his staff was like, oh, "They already have the tapes." So, like, not only that, but this stuff is like wicked, incriminating, like really bad. But it's also easy to make up dumb shit about case in point there is a clip of a guy walking up to the capitol police and showing his hands with something in one of his hands as he's walking up to them to show them that he's unarmed which is true he is in fact unarmed he does have something in his right hand that's true 
Senator of Utah, Mike Lee. Elected Senator of Utah, Mike Lee, was like, hey, what about that guy who walked up to the Capitol Police and showed him a badge and they let him in that shows that this was a, a fix and that this was all staged and the FBI was in on it. Good point, Mike Lee. We ought to check that. Who was that guy? Any idea? He was convicted. He was convicted of storming the Capitol. And the thing in his hand, it, it was a vape. Uh, was, wasn't a badge. It was a vape. It was a vape. Not even like a Metro card? Like, Nope. Nope. Just he was holding his vape. He was like, look, I'm unarmed. But he's had his vape in his hand. You know, because he had been, you know, vaping in the Capitol as an act of rebellion. I, I don't know. Like, that guy had already pleaded guilty and is serving time in jail. But Mike Lee got that tiny clip of footage and, and jumped on it as if this was evidence of some sort of, you know, alternative reality. Now we've I mean, got. I don't know how to break out. this to you, but there is no truth on Truth Social. It's not just that it's on Lee's first of all, still on Twitter and people are still looking at this and like uh, Maga Mike is releasing 44,000 hours of this stuff. So they're going to be able to clip tiny little pieces of all kinds of things and string them all together. But the reality is what's being fought out in court because you can't just make shit up in court. To wit, it's spelled Kevin. K E V E N Kevin. Before we get to the story that is number one in this script, I want to get to the second story in the script. <laughs> Donald Trump, Orange Jesus, Dangerous Pumpkin, is torn into Liz Cheney over claims made in her new book about his reaction to the 2020 election. The former Republican representative of Wyoming, an anti-Trump Republican, has written in in, uh, in her memoir, Oath and Honor, about uh, Trump. Among her claims is that Trump became depressed and stopped eating after he lost the 2020 election to Joe Biden, prompting Republican Representative dumb Kevin McCarthy to visit him. Newsweek contacted representatives for both Trump and McCarthy via email to comment on the story. This is where I, I grabbed this from. They didn't comment. Uh, Cheney said she asked McCarthy why he visited Trump at his Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida three weeks after the Capitol riot on January 6th. That was the day when hundreds of Trump supporters stormed the Capitol and, you know, shit on the walls. Uh, dumb Kevin told her that it was because he was worried that Trump wasn't eating and he was depressed and sad. Okay. That's pretty reasonable, right? You know, your friend lost an election. He he was publicly humiliated. You know, you haven't heard from him. You might go check on him, right? You ever, you ever done that for, for a friend of yours? No, like last week. And, Not because they lost an election. They were just going through some stuff. So I you brought them showed some, up. We, we sat on the porch. Food. We drank a bottle of wine. It had a heart to heart. Yeah. That's right. what you did. an entire show on this network called Hard Talking and Overcoming, which is about exactly that. You're going through something. Somebody shows up with like, you know, a cake or in my case, several sandwiches. And they go, look, here. Another Midwestern friend brought a casserole. Right. If you're Jewish. A traditional Midwestern gift. <laughs> yeah. Oh, somebody died. Here's a kugel. You'll feel better. Here's a hat dish. But right. yes. So Continuing. that so, so far that, we're normal ish. So far, Liz Cheney is is claiming that, you know, dumb Kevin was like caring about his friend. And that, that's that's cool, right? He showed up with a casserole. Showed up at the casserole. According to Trump, that's not what happened. Quote, crazy Liz Cheney 
all women are crazy when, when Trump writes things. Yeah. Who suffers from Trump derangement syndrome at a level rarely seen before, writes in her boring new book that Kevin, K-E-V-E-N, Kevin McCarthy, said he came to Mar-a-Lago after the rigged, all caps, election because the former president was depressed and not eating. That statement is not true. I was not depressed. I was angry, all caps. And it was not that I was not eating. It was that I was eating too much. But that's not why Kevin, K-E-V-E-N, McCarthy was there. It was at Mar-a-Lago to get my support and to bring the Republican Party together, only good intentions. Liz Cheney, on the other hand, went on to lose her seat in Congress by the largest margin for a sitting congressperson in the history of the U.S. She then worked with others on the J6 committee to delete and destroy the evidence and findings of the committee. That's what he wrote. So he misspelled. Where do you want, where do you want to start with that? Because there, there's a lot there. Go on. I OK, so I'm not depressed. I was angry. OK. The definition of depression is anger turns turned inward. So those are not mutually exclusive. Well, men terms. can't be sad; they can only be angry. That's one of the right. Words. Yeah, I have a book for my son that says men that says boys can feel more than just happy or mad. No, um, no, no. I want to teach him that. But yes, uh, clearly Trump did not get that book. Um, and that I was eating too much. Actually, that is more believable than not eating. Sure, but he's like, a rotund individual. I think correct. we would notice had he stopped eating. However, if he put on another 20 pounds, I'm not sure we would. So that I'm gonna go with I, I'm gonna side with Trump on that. He probably was overeating instead of undereating. But the point like being this. inappropriately eating. But his his being accused of like he, he you know he was he wasn't eating. He's like, not only was I not eating, I was eating too much. He was like <laughs> It was, it's such an overcompensation. I know. <laughs> Instead of being like, no, I was eating fine. He was like, I was eating too much. Like, it's a badge like, of honor. You know, a lot of depressed people do overeat. So if he's saying it's I'm not point. depressed, but here I am overeating, he's not helping the I was not depressed argument. I was angry and, and furiously pounding nachos. <laughs> Throwing cheeseburgers against the wall. Um, yeah, and then at the end, he's like, only good intentions. Well, okay. Cheney said he went down there to check on his friend. That sounds like a good intention. What was this evil intention that he was assuming she had talked about? To make sure he was eating? The guy's not going to waste away to nothing anytime soon, even if he wasn't eating. Let's be real. Like that guy could not eat for months and probably he still be a hibernate, man. Like <laughs> <laughs> he could be. I mean, that's pretty petty to like pick out his weight, but like you brought it up, dude. Right. Not only that, he brought it up. Not me. I didn't bring up this. This is clearly Trump saying I was eating too much. So one of the 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 telltales that Trump uh, typed out a a fake tweet as opposed to dictating it or like speech to text is misspellings. But there's yet another child left behind. Right. So like there's Kofefi is like the famous one, but like Kevin, yeah, every, every drink in DC was named that for a while. That's right. But some really Kevin, delicious ones, actually. K E V E N Kevin. I, I don't know yeah. if autocorrect like wouldn't catch it. I mean, the most common spelling of Kevin would be K E V I N, which would be how Kevin McCarthy actually spelled it. So even if it was autocorrected, it would have autocorrected with the I. I don't know. Here's my phone. I was gonna try it. Well, speaking of K E V E N, who now has to change his name uh, to be spelled that way, of course. Because in Obviously. politics, once Trump misspells something, that's the way it's spelled. Uh, is he going to change his name? Maybe he doesn't have to, because uh, what did he announce this week? He's leaving us. Yeah, he's fucking gone. 
He's, he's this reminds me of a boss I had once who left. All right, so I was a school teacher. School year starts in September. He left in November to go into consulting. Turns out there was like four lawsuits against him. So this is like, I'm not quitting. I'm going into consulting. So dumb Kevin is leaving the house uh, after being ousted as, as speaker. And he's doing it in, in a really like petty way, right? So obviously yeah. he's going to go off to some lobby well, shop. Wait, wait, okay, hold on. Before you get to you, name any other senator that's leaving by forcefully has never left petty. <laughs> well, a lot of them just like, you know, disappear it's, into the sunset. Right. But the last two we shut up for six months and don't run again. Yeah, but yeah. These, the last two we've heard, they're leaving petty. <laughs> it's like, so there's there's like 40 uh, there's some commonalities there. people who are not returning next term, whether that's because they're not going to run I mean, again if, or because they got forced out or whatever. But if you're going to leave, that's the acceptable way is you just don't run again. Just say you don't run again and, you know, want to yeah. spend more time with your family or whatever. But Dumb Kevin is leaving midterm, and he's doing it in in a particularly petty fashion. To your point, Brian, the guy who most recently got forced out before him <laughs> went out in a blaze of glory, talking about went out a blaze of something. All the puppies from the veterans or whatever, like <laughs> he, he you know he burned all the bridges on his way down. Kevin is not burning all the bridges, but what he is doing is he's sticking his successor with a serious fuck you. Mike Johnson yeah. is operating on a margin so thin it was recently uh, accosted by P. Diddy. Is that, I'm going too far. Sorry. It was recently accosted by Harvey Weinstein. No, I'm, I can't make that same joke. So you know, the Republicans have a very thin majority in the House. And when dumb Kevin leaves, it falls to even thinner. California law requires that the governor, Gavin Newsom, calls for a special election in a certain period of time. But the fastest somebody's going to get into that seat is June. So... Not only is he mad that they forced him out, but he's figured out how to how to screw them on his way down. Santos got cast out of the house by overwhelming numbers. And then dumb Kevin leaves. Mike Johnson's down to a three vote margin. Three. That means if they don't all show up on a given day, somebody's sick or whatever. His his chance to govern is over. And watch one of them catch a, a wild hair and decide they want to vacate the guy. Because, of course, Maga Mike agreed to the same rules as dumb Kevin. House could fall apart. Could fall apart again. It's It's so easy. The precipice that this government leans on is so close. It reminds me of these places like Israel or Italy or even Great Britain where somehow David Cameron's back in government. Um, and Boris recently had to like go in front of a tribunal and was like, I'm not sorry. Fuck all y'all. Like they don't, they're not learning anything. All white men. I just want to put that out there. Yeah. The right wing White men who have run the world continue to fail at like basic governance. Like, and yet women are too uh, what emotional? Is that what's often said? Yeah, you're too emotional. Did and, you see the temper tantrum these men have thrown in the last week over some odd shit or whatever? Yeah, we're too hormonal and emotional, and yet these have been fairly epic temper tantrums. You can't. Uh, understand math I heard. right oh yeah there's the angles problem I forgot yeah angles every hey, time I come on the show you're gonna have to link that article now did you hear about the time that uh, 
somebody got the first photograph of a black hole? Yes. Yeah. What was her name? You don't have to on the tip of my, it wasn't my it wasn't my husband. So it wasn't about. your husband. He should have tried harder. Yeah, it's a sore spot. Shout out to your to your husband who who probably has to like live in like the nerd jock world of Goddard, where like everybody has <laughs> several discoveries, and they all like lorded over each other. Like, yeah, 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 that's a great galaxy. But did you see this nebula I found? Yeah, the world of people who study black holes is not that large. <laughs> no. They all like work in the same office. Fucking nerds. Yeah, my life is Big Bang Theory and I'm Penny, so I don't watch that show. A sure lot of incredibly smart people. Um, but yes, that was there are a lot of incredibly smart women at NASA. I do know that. The, men the science world like is hang out with us. The science world is showing a little more equality than maybe the political world. Speaking of equality, uh, let's talk about curling for a second. Uh, what's going on with our, with our curling club? Well, there was a board meeting that I did not listen to because I was in Pittsburgh um, spending time with my family at a science museum. And on Facebook yesterday... USA and Curling, welcome back to the Potomac Curling Club, to which pretty much everyone who didn't spend their Thanksgiving weekend listening to the board meeting went, I'm sorry, what? Uh, I think we had no idea. Our own board of directors at Potomac Curling Club also said, uh, what? I mean, they voted for it, so they should know. Yeah, but they hadn't gotten a confirmation back from USA Curling. Yeah, that's what. So then we did get an email that said we were waiting for a confirmation. And I feel like it's one of those things like you paid the membership fee, you're in. Like there's not like an approval process. Or maybe there is. Maybe. I'm, can we get Dean back on and ask this question? Yes. So okay. uh, he, he's he been in contact with us and uh, he wants to come back. So you and I are going to have friend to have of the show. a special uh, episode where we, we, friend of the show, Dean Gemmel, is going to be on and uh, we'll have to ask him about hey what's up man like not so not only should we be back in right which we're glad to be back in i'm glad to be back in i'm i'm personally glad to be back in after they basically agreed to nearly everything that we said in the first place um which seemed pretty obvious and everybody's cool with um but i'm also glad to be back in because i want to be part of the group and i want to i want everybody else you know to be to be in uh also, I just want to get everybody back on the show and and like to talk about. It. Wouldn't it be really cool to just have uh, the curling show? Really, yes. like, wouldn't it be great if you and I, Stacy and 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 Chip, settled the great GNCC USA curling? And just say that is the one outstanding. Is there? Yes, USA Curling has made a lot of changes. Um, they made a lot of leadership changes, which I think is what was most important to people is that, you know, people who love and care about the sport and know about it are actually the people who are making decisions about it, not kind of nameless, faceless board members who have nothing to do with curling um, and, you know, abusive soccer coaches or soccer. Who, what was his title? President? Um, so Sorry. anyway, people who are involved in the sport are now kind of running it. A lot of it has been, and I have to give props to USA Curling for doing this. They, instead of saying like, we are the people who know everything and are in charge of everything, a lot has been kind of farmed out to committees and task force of people who actually do know about that kind of thing. Um, friend of the show, Deb Martin and, um, is handling some DEI. There's a, um, have we ever, have you ever had Bobby Todd on this show? Uh, if not, she, she needs to be on your list. But uh, I, well, we've been trying to get her on. Yeah. She's a very awesome person is like, you know, working on anyway, all these people who are incredibly smart and the sport loves them have been tasked to kind of look at a lot of different things, including like there's an arena curling group now um, made up of people who actually are, 
part of arena clubs and you know what a concept to look at the people who are actually involved in it and ask them what they need and want shocking instead of telling them what they need and want um so yeah i i appreciate that part of it and that that even if some of it's kind of playing for the camera i appreciate that People are being people who know stuff are being asked about it instead Look, of just the camera angle, being made. Like that, that is totally fine if if it yields results. Yeah, Look, people can accuse it of being fake or they can accuse it of being PR or whatever. If it works, it works, right? Yeah. If if we're all back in, we all just want to be back together. Really, I mean, curlers are not adversarial. Uh, you know, we're we're sort of a friendly bunch as a group, and uh, you know. We'd like to put this this kerfuffle behind us. There are still some unhealed wounds and we can have I can't wait. We we definitely need to do like, you know, the what are we like a year and a half later follow-up shows because there are some things that have gone really, really well, and there are some things that I think still need to be hugged out, for lack of a better term. Yep. Well, we'll um, but yeah, GNCC is part of it. Um, and I started working with USWCA after that whole kerfluffle because that was a group of people that I thought were really gr good group of people who fell into a deep pit and needed to claw their way out. So I personally started working with them. Um, but there's still some stuff there that could be hugged out. But I feel like we're healing as a group, slowly but surely. But it, it's happening. I think we'll get there. I and and we'll work to facilitate that. Uh, you know, we'll let we'll, we'll stay tuned. There's there's more coming. Okay, um, the Justice Department until charges Monday against a retired ambassador. He he was an ambassador to Bolivia was charged with like spying for Cuba for like 30 years. This is like some serious shit. This dude, they weren't even paying him. He was just like in on the cause. He, he yeah, their areas. Man, That's the most awesome. dangerous. So he, he's like a committed, uh, like Castro, uh, Cuban, you know, like Marxist, communista, like all the way there, Che Guevara kind of guy, right? And he worked his way through the State Department by embodying this persona as this right-wing conservative, uh, you know, Republican. And he gets these jobs and he ends up being appointed to ambassador to Bolivia. And he's he's working in the State Department. He's working, uh, you know, he's he's a real high level guy. And the whole time he's funneling stuff back to the Cubans. For thirty years, forty years, he was he was funneling stuff back to the Cubans. I forgot what year it is. Since the seventies, this guy has been shit. Okay, since the eighties, I don't I, don't make me that. I way. think of. The 70s is three is 30 years ago. Yes, that's right. We all do. The 90s. That's not how that works. So, um, but this dude was up to it, man. And and he was, he was, he had access to everything. Everything. And he funneled it all back to the Cubans. What I'm shocked about is that he's he's going to trial. They caught him. And they put him in jail and they're they're gonna, you know, revoke his bail and all that stuff, and they're gonna they're gonna try try to convict him. I was sure if you did that and like turned over our secrets to the Cubans for that long, and the FBI caught you, you had an accident in the gunfight or whatever. Like Well, I'm sure some do. This is the one we're hearing about. Good on the right. Good on the FBI. For being a little more on the up and up, let's call it, you know. I mean, you got to figure 
they've caught other people that have, you know, had accidents. Correct. So every once in a while, if you catch someone, you probably do need to put them on trial just to prove that that's still a thing. Yeah. But yes, it is shocking that he wasn't in a horrific car crash. Or maybe we all just watch too many movies. I'm not sure. No, 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 no. You're right. That, <laughs> that's correct. Okay. Uh, the last thing we want to talk about is uh, the Belties. Congrats. So our our network, uh, Beltway Radio, we are, this is basically the end of year one. This network has been around for almost a whole year. We, when we finish December, we will have finished an entire year. When we start in January, we'll be brand new. And uh, that will be year two. You'll be a toddler. Ish. <laughs> Ish. The terrible of, twos. Oh, oh, watch out. <laughs> of, of Bellway Radio. Now, listen. Uh, we're not going to say we, we've been great, but I want to say uh, for briefly on this show that this year I've learned a ton, mostly about how little I knew going into this and how inept and unqualified I am to be uh, running a network and, uh, and doing anything like this. Fortunately, I have very, very clever and uh, brilliant partners, the 420 guys uh, who have really helped and really done most of the work. I just show up on Thursdays and, and yammer about stuff in a microphone and occasionally program things in a computer all of which could be done by somebody smarter than me. So I really don't even need to be here, but uh, it's been an honor. So we had our award show last Saturday, the Belties, and uh, a lot of people won some awards. Brian, you won some awards. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so I really want to know, uh, well, first of all, Tez is not here. He has, I, yeah, every award show that he was supposed to be at, he never showed up for. That's correct. So this is the third award show in a row since he's been on this show that he did not make it to. And tonight was when I was going to give him the speech that I didn't get to give him at the award show. And then again, he's not here. <laughs> So he's, 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 he's afraid of award chips. He's betting a thousand. He's afraid of success, man. Correct. So I'm, I'm just going to read this. So we have it for posterity and we can, we can put it in a clip and tag him in it a hundred times on social media that he doesn't care about. So here's the speech that I wanted to give for Tez for the award for chip chat. You ready? This award is really for Tez. He's been on the show for several years, though at times it may feel like several lifetimes. Tez brings insight and his favorite word, nuance, to the radio in ways not heard even on the big public broadcasters. His relentless pursuit of guests and dedication to show preparation are evident and the quality product that he delivers every week. As this award is for you. Hooray! Yeah, that was that was uh, the speech I wanted to give. Because he doesn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to watch him come up and have to explain all that. But anyway, <laughs> Brian, how is, how is the award show for you? Um... For starters, it did interrupt my uh, exotica fun time. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but all in all, it was actually it was a really good festive event. Um, um, shout out to you and the 420 guys. Um, I, I was, I mean, for year one, I, I felt like it was a, a good uh, way for you all to acknowledge the rest of the, all the programs on the network. Um, because pretty much it, it, I understand what you guys were doing uh, when you hand out. Pretty much it was like everyone got an award. So and I and I appreciate that, um, especially when I won. <laughs> uh, um, 
you know, giving me an award for, you know, super producer and I saw it on the belt. <laughs> so, which was kind of cool. Um, so yeah, I think it was, it was, it was nice and fun. So it was, it was very enjoyable. So thank you to you guys. So what we did just so everybody knows is that it really, really, we gave, um, thank yous to all the shows. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just, we had awards, right. That people voted on for uh best, uh, new show and best personality. Uh, and then we also had, uh, you know, best show. And then we had some extra awards that we, as the, as the network kind of leaned on, but we wanted to give special recognition to you, Brian, uh, for being the super producer as your belt says. And because I mean, really this, this whole thing doesn't work without you. And we could not be prouder of what you do here and and i couldn't do what what i do without you so it, it really means a lot you know to have you be uh, on the team and and it really it's it's fantastic so uh we wanted to thank you but we also wanted to thank all the other shows because you know they they stuck with us this was our first year running this thing we were we were handed uh you know a functional network and we mostly kept it functional. Had a few hiccups, a few computer glitches, but sort of up and running, I would say. So that felt pretty good. Also, the show went off really well. It was it was supposed to be a two hour show. We kept it within time limit. We kept it moving. We didn't have a lot of downtime. Nobody got bored. Nobody got tired. Uh, nobody got in a fight. So. You know, compared to other uh, previous award show with this network, or the it's pretty. Well, I mean, you, I, I, I think you know, like I said, it's a year one. Year one, you kind of want to keep it simple, keep it you know, intimate, in what you guys did, which was fine. So, uh, if you, I believe, within time, you'll probably be bigger and grander. You know, maybe depends on how you guys. Next feel. year, it's at FedEx. Hundred percent. Yeah. Brian, Out, gotta, outside of FedEx. No, it'll be at FedEx. <laughs> We're gonna do it. It's gonna be in the in the closet there. At FedEx, uh, right next to uh, Rob Rivera's uh, new job. <laughs> right in the janitor's closet. All right. Uh, so there you go. That was uh, that's basically the end of the show. We didn't have a lot. Yeah, it's just like any award show. You know, play a song. We hear the music. It's time to say uh, goodbye. Thank you to Brian, the super producer, as your as your award uh, belt says. Thanks to all the radio stars on Beltway Radio for a great night, a great year. Thanks to our radio partners, ESPN Deportes, uh, Big Ten Network, and the ACC Network. Thanks to NOGN for keeping us on for another week. Thanks to our buddy Key Wayne. He's holding it down there in Louisiana. Uh, thanks to our home on the interwebs, coplaymedia.com. Thanks, as always, to our family here at Beltway Radio for making us sound as smooth as the Belties presenters. All right, Stacey, where can everybody find you on the social medias? Oh, man, I haven't been on in a while, but at Currently Purple on and various you- platforms. On where? On Twitter? Or... Is it Twitter anymore? On what used to be Twitter? I don't know. I'm not calling it. Yeah, I can't. I can't do it. But it's still at Curl Me Purple. There you go. All right. And you can find me on Twitter at ChipChat You can find us on Facebook or Instagram at Red Chip Chat. You can, of course, find us every Thursday night here on Bellway Radio and Beyond. I'm Chip. That's Stacey. That's Brian. You've been listening to Chip Chat on Beltway Radio and Beyond. Sweet.